a Irina Calicu é investigadora do Centro de Estudos Sociais, eh, trabalha sobre eh, a justiça ambiental, a crise ecológica, são conceitos que, eh, que vêm aqui desconstruir, precisamente. Então, a Irina vai apresentar a sua comunicação em inglês. My topic is uh, environmental justice, justice as a framework of addressing, let's say, uh, environmental conflict. So, many of you uh, are familiar with the um, uh, anti-mining movement, probably from Latin America and from other countries, uh, other regions of the world, and m less uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, this was my initial starting point to see that a lot of the new, let's say, emergent conflicts in Eastern Europe in the post-communist uh, times uh, were similar with a lot of the conflicts in Latin America uh, related to uh, proposal and uh, my anti-mining, uh, gold mining or um, other forms of extraction kind of massive development project. So um, when I was doing my field work in Transylvania I, um, I, in 2007, so that was uh, kind of a long time ago, um, I, I had a difficult time making sense of what was happening because for, for let's say, for us in, in this region it was something new. Uh, uh, most of the people that I was talking to were, were not, didn't know what to believe, especially in a, in a, in a context in which the mantra, no, the mantra of development was proposed as the only alternative to think about uh, what's happening in Eastern Europe. We were supposed to become more European, more Western European, more like the West, more developed, and that meant inevitably extractivism. So um, looking at this uh, particular conflict that was happening in, in Transylvania, uh, where a, a Canadian corporation was trying to open uh, one of the largest open uh, gold mine, open cast mining, um, I realized that uh, some of the uh, injustice or justice frameworks were not very um, were not very easy to to adapt. So I will explain myself how I ended up thinking about environmental justice in a way that is kind of undoing what justice is all about. Um, when I was uh, doing my field work, um, the most the prevalent kind of uh, observation was that the population was uh, torn, was uh, didn't know what to believe, didn't know what to feel, and didn't know what to decide about uh, a position. No? So this ambiguity of taking a position was a very important ground to analyze the situation, especially because of the fact that the desired position or the imposed position was to be pro-mining and pro-development. No? So uh, playing with this ambiguity was sort of a tactic of resistance, but also a, a real uh, state of being, you know, in, in the region. It was, um, it was not that uh, people could easily say, I am pro or against. They just didn't know where to position themselves. Uh, they understood uh, the so-called growth kind of imperative, but in the same time they understood that the new forms of extractivism would bring actually things that they are, they never seen before, no? So the region in Transylvania was traditionally a mining region, but they understood that the open cast would bring a new dimension, would, be, would bring uh, total relocation of the population, would bring the devastation of four mountains in the, in the region. So they understood, they, they, for example, in quotes of people, um, this uh, corporation is trying to do something that even the uh, emperor of austria Hungary. Or the, or the Russian couldn't do. So they kind of expressed uh, this in a historical context to show that the, the difference of uh, impact um, is understood, is, um, is not something to, to uh, marginalize. No? So it was a new threat that they were going through and they didn't know how to react to it. So this ambiguity was my starting point to talk about um, a movement, you know, a growing emergent local movement because the population realized that they have to organize themselves somehow civic, as civic actors, as citizens. No? So they created an organization, they created um, 
uh, alliances with NGOs. So they did all the typical kind of forms of mobilization that are um, discussed in the environmental justice and in social justice movement theory. No? They uh, did petitions, they did the local referendum, they did the uh, transnational networking, they did artistic kind of creative forms of, of protests, and um, we are talking about 10 years of such mobilization, no? uh, not one day, not a few months, 10 years of continuously transforming their life in order to face the presence of the corporation. No? The corporation didn't start mining, but they created a continuous presence in this village by opening a, an office, by giving some sort of temporary jobs for those who wanted to, to collaborate, by um, imposing an atmosphere of intimidation that this mining will happen. Sooner or later, in your lifetime or after you die, this mine will happen and we are not leaving. <laughs> Just like you are not leaving, we are not leaving. So, uh, the situation after a few years of, of having to face the corporation every morning, I remember the locals were saying to me, um, we no longer, we cannot survive with the thought that we are opposing mining. What we need to do is find different meanings of living together with our own enemy in this place. So it was a very very uh, nerve-wracking kind of uh, situation for most uh, locals. Um, uh, obviously, in this context of intimidation, a lot of locals decided to sell their land. So almost 60% of the land of the population uh, sold entirely their properties or their land to, to the corporation. So, uh, the, the injustice, let's say, what the environmental injustice is called land grabbing, is already happening. It's how, the question is how those remaining locals are living with the fact that most of the land around them is, uh, um, is owned by the corporation. Uh, this is a continuous kind of intimidation that is expressed in, in, in quotes of, and testimonies, something like, uh, I'm afraid that sooner or later I, I will I will uh, feel obliged to leave and I will never have a home to come back to. So obviously place attachments and attachments to, to the local area uh, is very strong and a lot of people mobilize themselves not so much for environmental reasons but for issues related to, let's say, uh, the possibility of making a living alternatively in the region. The fact that for them was very important to, to create uh, the vision or the social imaginary that there is something else than uh, growth through extractivism, um, which somehow happened through the con in the context of mobilization and social environmental movement emerging uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, this um, vision at least, or this possibility that something else can be done is already materializing itself through uh, everyday kind of efforts and um, alliances to create um, a different uh, future, not for the region. And this is something that in my paper uh, I'm, I'm talking about as a process of subjectification. Um, I'm going to explain this exactly in, in the context of um, of my critique of environmental justice, which is usually discussed in the literature as a disproportionate ex exposure of uh, uh, minorities to contamination or to toxicity. No? Uh, this started uh, in the context of civil rights movement, so a lot of the framework of resistance or framework of justice is translated e eventually in legal procedures related to demanding for rights, demanding for consultation, participation, um, and um, recognition pretty much uh, before the law, no? very much a legal procedure. Um, very much inspired also by the US context of uh, civil rights movement. Uh, and my particular focus is to deconstruct a little bit, as I'm saying, to undo a little bit this, uh, what Benford would call commodification of justice. Because to a certain extent, um, 
in these conflicts, what remains to be distributed as justice is very much uh, a form of cheap mitigation and, and compensation <coughs> for education. Even the World Bank uh, policies put an emphasis on the right to be informed, the right to be consulted, uh, the right to be guaranteed compensation for uh, losses, no? But in the end, the discussion about justice is still confined to the terms of the consensus, no? The consensus is that there is no other option but uh, economic growth, um, and and this within this consensus we can think of procedural justice. This is very much a procedural form of justice, no? So the literature, um, despite dealing with what I would say, uh, the fact that environmental conflicts bring, bring a more structural visibility, uh, no, uh, bring visibility <coughs> to the more structural forces of injustice, uh, for me it was uh, an invitation to, to make a critique of this uh, approach to justice as distributional, no? Distributional of benefits, whatever benefit is better than nothing, no? Uh, uh, when it comes to this. But, um, but at the same time, uh, uh, this approach, distributional liberal approach to justice, uh, inspired by social justice theories pretty much, uh, is very limited and it doesn't, it doesn't um, uh, address the more per pervasive forms of injustice that uh, continue even with the distribution, let's say, being done. Um, so the conflicts that I looked at in Transylvania uh, prompted me to what I discussed uh, in, in my paper, the preliminary problem of justice. So before we talk about justice, social or environmental justice, um, I found, uh, I mean, I'm a political scientist, so I'm also inspired by certain uh, theoreticians of power, and uh, I found uh, this uh, idea of preliminary problem of justice uh, developed by Rancière a good way to discuss the critique. Uh, by preliminary problem meaning exactly the, um, the fact that we can see that injustice happens not only in the distribution, no? Not only in the way we think of who gets what from this conflict and how, how can we get to some sort of conciliation, reconciliation. No? Uh, the, the critique that I was making by saying that there are other problems before we even talk of justice, which is usually procedural justice, is the fact that uh, the injustice is in, in the exact uh, production of some people uh, as being dispensable, as being the surplus population that can be easily removed and moved. Uh, many times, for example, in the conflict in Czech Republic that I'm looking at now, we are talking about relocation of same population few times during the lifetime. So the, the same family is relocated few times uh, during their lifetime. <coughs> So it, this is a preliminary process of uh, continuous um, um, acclimatization. No? These people are almost um, uh, used with the, the living with the anxiety and with the insecurity of, uh, of their futures. Um, so in a way, this climate of producing people, David Harvey would say, producing people as trashy in order to stomach trash. So once, once you are uh, continuously living a history of being uh, and internalize a sort of image and fixed position of yourself as, uh, as subaltern, as fixed, uh, inferiorly political, then uh, manipulation and propaganda of corporate kind of interest in, in this uh, area functions wonderfully, no? Um, and this was for me preliminary problem of justice because such a manipulation and such a pervasive climate of uh, production of subalterns was not, was not something that you can put in a law, was not something that you can change by law, was not something that you can easily transform through procedures, no? It was uh, in the air, kind of, and, and it was difficult to... to to address, no, even in dialogic kind of um, discussions with the officials. One of the examples that I give is um, the fact that uh, at some point in 2014, I think, uh, the president of Romania visited this region, uh, uh, this village in Transylvania, and um, 
this sounded great, no? It was a kind of recognition that environmental justice is looking for. Wow, the president is actually going to hear us, no? So uh, all the media and the, you know this is a big scandal now in Romania. So it's uh, everybody wants to see what's going to happen, and all the politicians want to get credit out of it. So it was uh, a big mess because when the president stayed like me in front of of the people in Russia Montana, what he did actually was not to listen, <laughs> but to further impose. Uh, sort of the ego of the macho extractivist uh, president who, listen to me, you know, I'm the president who, by the way, at that time had a big popularity because he was the strong kind of a uh, populist leader, no? So I am here to really, really put uh, your mind back in your, no? And you have to understand that you are just just like the corporation used to say to them, this is something international, this is something global, you cannot escape this. You are just some, you know, little ants that uh, don't, doesn't really know how to deal with life and we tell you what is good for you, you have to listen to us. So very paternalistic, very, very uh, manipulative. Um, and, and these peasants are not, not naive at all and they do not mind fighting. So it was a huge conflict when, uh, when this uh, uh, intervention, intervention happened and basically the, the locals uh, stood up and said we are not going to engage in discussions with you. If you want to kick us out you have to bring the military. So the discussion was clearly put in the, in the right terms. If this is not a democratic kind of uh, dialogic uh, debate. This is about imposition, so we have to discuss it correctly. No, the correct uh, discussion would be: uh, it's about nation state, it's about corporate interests, and you want to kick us out of our own land. So you have to do it with the military, because it doesn't make sense otherwise. No. So um, what I'm trying to say also in my paper by undoing environmental justice is precisely that this. These are sort of more insurgent position, no? When you, when you address it like that and you question the democratic process that uh, should be about, um, you are not, no longer talking about social movement or environmental justice, you are talking about a, a way to uh, reformulate the whole debate, no? the, a way to create dissensus over the consensus. This is what I'm always talking about. And, um, one of the ways you can do it, of course, is through all kinds of legal means, which is what the movement did and grew uh, a lot in the last term, in the last years. But um, for me, what was interesting, and with this I'm going to change to um, close. For me, what was interesting was also we are talking about people who never had the experience, or actually who were denied the experience of being <coughs> citizens in the sense of engaged, no activists or engaged citizens, no? We are talking about people who, who mostly did farming or agriculture and who lived, uh, you know, a simple life. Uh, what they had to do and what I observed uh, in, their, in their living was uh, what I call the subjectification, a process of transformation of political subjectivities because they had to kind of assert themselves as politically equal in a sense. They had to say, no, we are not just those who don't understand or don't uh, know what to want to what to believe. Now we understand what's happening and we know what we want, no kind of this kind of discourse. So um, this is uh, what I saw precisely what uh, Rancière was describing in Proletarian Nights. In this case, he was talking about the revolution of 1830. Um, he observed and he was reading the diaries of workers and sort of like what I was observing in what the people were saying in Russia Montana was that they were making time, no, they were taking time for things that they were not supposed to do. So they were doing things that they were not supposed to do. They ended up doing things that um, they never thought they will, no? Um, they changed their habitual lives and they try to divide all their responsibilities and transform all their identities and their positions in a way that they never thought it will happen, no? Uh, to become something more than just mining, something more than just farmers, 
something more than just women or men, no? It was always in this process of effervescent kind of emergence of, of the movement, they found themselves talking and doing things that they never thought they will. And this was also a, a sort of a celebratory way of, of doing justice, if you want, uh, that is more at the level of uh, personal, but also collective re revigoration or rethinking, no? Um, to, to end up on TV, no? to end up uh, uh, talking public speakers, to, to, to uh, be considered no, by journalists and by scholars as an important voice for, for them. And in all this context was uh, extremely important. And uh, obviously it helped the movement, but it helped with uh, their capacity to deal with such a stressful situation to give themselves the, the hope, if you want, uh, even if it sounds naive, but the hope that they are not just politically insignificant. Uh, and, and for me, this uh, switch of, uh, in, in the everyday life uh, was important, not because of uh, <coughs> uh, reasons of justice in the procedural terms, but because of the, the feeling that they can have a significance Politically, what do I mean by politically, and why is not just a, an ethical position? And here is where I, I uh, for me, was important this debate uh, of ethics was because um, one of the things that they didn't want to to become, they didn't want to become those poor that anybody should la be lamenting about. No, they didn't want to be considered just those. Uh, Dispowered, uh, disempowered, and uh, those, uh, um, let's say, weak, uh, uh, oppressed people. Uh, they realize that this is this is uh, actually a way to be further manipulated, to be further oppressed, <coughs> and to be further patronized by various actors. So playing with different I identities, uh, not just the strong uh, activist or the um, uh, important uh, speaker, but also simply the importance of being an, a farmer. For them that was a power. Uh, the importance of reproducing basic livelihood. Why is that not a power? Why is that not relevant? So they, they try to emphasize that power and, and um, equality politically is also uh, cap the capacity to reproduce life. They, rea they understood that they are an important factor in this. No? So this is part of the movement and is part of the, let's say, uh, transformation at the, at the individual level as well. Uh, that was for me po much more political precisely because um, it didn't mean a sort of a simple um, normative approach to what is happening. Uh, for me, maybe I'm wrong, but the normative, the, the idea of being uh, correct or not, uh, good or not, uh, is, is, is a political issue. No? Uh, the consensus, um, in the end, may be ethical. Co capitalism has a lot of ethical, uh, ethical components. No? But in the end, it's a political decision no? that is enforced through institutions and that we internalize as being, uh, as being part of it. No? That this is what subject, subjectivation means, that we are not just uh, oppressed by power, but we are sustained by power. Who we are is sustained by power. We have to first realize it. No? So I don't know if I made any sense, but maybe I should stop. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much.